calling Chris Anderson in London. Hello, Rick in Chicago. This is London. Thanks, thanks for remembering. <laughs> I hesitated there for a moment. <laughs> Who am I talking to? Uh, uh, so we're about to get History Happy Hour underway, uh, and we want to welcome our viewers both on Facebook and YouTube, and we'll be starting in a moment or two. So please comment, check in, let us know that you're here, say hello, and we'll uh, we'll try to say hello back. You know, we just we just desperately hope that someone is there. And I did I did Chris, I brought a friend to the to the uh, show today. I to see an arm. Wait, oh here, here you go. Here he is. He's hey. uh, here to accompany me on this July fourth weekend. I know you're you know it's your favorite holiday. Uh, which holiday would you be referring to? Rick? That would be Independence Day, Mr. Ooh, Anderson. What? <laughs> Independence from uh, tyranny, Mr. Well, Anderson. Then again, I don't know what 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 do you speak of? Well, uh, anyway, uh, we're delighted. Hello, Doreen, and hi, Kathy, and everybody else who's joining us. It's a beautiful day in a lot of places, so uh, some people may be tuning in later, but we appreciate those of you who are here with us now. And um, yeah, so um, it's, uh, it is it is July 4th weekend and, and we have a subject that is appropriate for that. Chris, do you think, are we almost ready uh, um, to, to play the very famous? I think we should, yes. The world famous, is, is it that time? It is that time indeed. Okay, here we go. Here we go. So, um, welcome to History Happy Hour. The bar is open. Bar is open. And, you know, I would, uh, just to say before we get into our show topic today, we did actually, we were out and about in Chicago yesterday, and the fireworks were insane. Yeah. The amount of personal fireworks that people were doing, and apparently this is true in other cities as well, it was wild. It was, it, we were at a barbecue at someone's house and it was as if there was a war on three sides of us. And it, no. we, couldn't, we couldn't talk, it was that loud. Those aren't like personal firearms, this is Chicago after all. Uh, <laughs> that was going on in other neighborhoods, oh, okay. not in the one where we were, unfortunately. So greetings to everybody, to Robert and John and, and Ted. Uh, nice to see you here, and Ken and Audrey. And who's, do you know this guy? Katz, uh, how no, do you pronounce no. the first name? I don't know. Um, and uh, everybody else who's there uh, as part of this. So it is um, uh, uh, Independence Day, and, uh, and, and I also brought Chris to celebrate. I was gonna fire a little salute with my oh, cannon really to good. say Independence Day and fire it over to you there in London and say, um, we're just we're happy to be we're happy to be done with you guys. <laughs> but uh, our we thought that would be a great weekend to bring on as a guest uh, someone to talk about uh, a battle that was the turning point of the American Revolution, the Battle of Saratoga in 1777. And Chris and I were actually at the Saratoga battlefield. Um, it was like a year ago yeah. together. Yeah. Uh, we'd both been there before, but we were there together, and it's an incredibly evocative battlefield, wouldn't you say? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And um, that is the first time that I got to meet the person who is our guest today, although Chris already knew him. Uh, uh, Eric Schnitzer is one of the nation's leading experts on this battle. Uh, he's been an interpreter and a historian at the Saratoga National Battlefield or National Historical Park for more than 20 years. He's written many articles and lectures uh, uh, about this battle. And uh, he is also the co-author of a new book. I have to, I'm trying to do all the things here at once. He's also the co-author of a new book about the battle called uh, With Don Troiani, a Campaign to Saratoga, uh, 1777. And finally, in introducing Eric, I just wanna say that our crack investigative team also uncovered a compromising photo of him. Uh, here it is. Actually, he emailed it to us. But Eric is also the founder and commander of the 62nd Foot Reenactor Regiment. And although he assures us he can nevertheless speak objectively about His the Majesty's 62nd Regiment, please. Huzzah. 
Thank Eric you. Eric Schnitzer, welcome. Thank you so much, Rick. And thank you. Have we that. harassed you enough yeah. yet? No, no. <laughs> oh, more to there, there'll more. be more to come. Okay. Uh, Eric, in the in the um, subtitle of your book, it says right there that Saratoga is the turning point of the American Revolution. So tell us, set the scene of this battle briefly and tell us why is it a turning point? What makes this an important battle worthy of our attention? Yeah, if I may, it's not so much the battles of Saratoga that are the turning point of the war. If the battles happened or didn't happen, it's not like the fortunes of the rest of the war would have uh, turned on the outcomes of those battles, tactically speaking. It's the strategic result and the political results of the battle. So uh, basically, long story short, General Burgoyne, British general, is bringing a British army out of Canada. His destination point is Albany, New York. He gets as far as what is now Saratoga National Historical Park, about 40 miles north of Albany. Two battles of Saratoga are fought. After the second of the two battles, Burgoyne is beaten in battle but he then begins the process of retreating north back toward Canada. But the uh, Army of the United States pursues Burgoyne, ends up surrounding his army, and forces Burgoyne to surrender. That's the turning point of the Revolutionary War because it marked, when Burgoyne surrendered at Saratoga, it marked the first time in world history that a British army ever surrendered. Oh, huzzah. Yeah, huzzah, yes. A British army had, sorry, no offense, Chris, a uh, British army had never surrendered before, never happened. And of course, nations uh, in Europe in, in particular look at that victory of the United States over a British army and they think, holy cow, look at this. Obviously, this uh, resonates principally and most immediately with France. It didn't take long for France to then come to the decision to overtly uh, recognize the United States as a real nation a legitimate nation, and also uh, with that Franco-American alliance comes a military alliance, a commercial alliance. So you have recognition of the United States by one of the world's foremost powers and a military alliance. So when you look at the Franco-American alliance joint operations post Saratoga, obviously because there were none before, uh, you have Rhode Island, 1778, didn't go well for the uh, allied forces. Then you have Savannah, Georgia, didn't go well for the Allied forces the following year. But finally, 1781, they thought they'd give it a you know third time's a charm at Yorktown, Virginia. And indeed, that all but ended the war. You know, the war lasted another two years, technically. But after Yorktown, uh, you know, the British had uh, really come to realize that uh, this war was not going to end in their favor. And, and before Chris jumps in with a question, I, I did forget one thing. Yes, you did. It is history happy hour, Eric. Did you bring a cocktail? I did indeed. I have That's, it right here. What have you got? I have a Casablanca. Ooh, uh, that's the wrong war, Eric. <laughs> I know, I know, but my wife, who is an expert mixologist, I'm not, I'm an expert drinker though, for what she can make. Uh, she said it would be appropriate for Stephen Ambrose tours. Oh, uh, a Casablanca. Very uh, nice. She's so, the standard then, wise woman, Eric. A mixologist <laughs> and an expert drinker is a marriage made in heaven. <laughs> Chris, what have you got? Uh, I've got my uh, Spitfire Ale. Nice. And I've got a, a, a nice IPA in my, is a colonial, a, a uh, replica colonial pewter as I can do. So. Is that ye old timey? It is. It is very ye old timey. It's uh <laughs> Hi, matey. Isn't that how they talked back then? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Just checking. Okay. Just checking. Chris. Well, no. So, Eric, one of the things um, that uh, kind of interests Rick and I when we were talking about it, when we first talked about the show is, like most Revolutionary War battles, um, they're kind of wrapped in um, myth and kind of old stories. And the story has certainly been told before. So what is it? that you said, aha, it's time for a new book that is going to actually kind of change our thoughts on the battle. Yeah, oh, I, I, writing about myth-busting subjects is one of my favorite things to do. And it began with Don Traiani himself. Uh, so Don, who I've known for uh, many, many years, called me one day 
a couple of years ago and said that he wanted to put together a book on the Northern Campaign of 1777, i.e. the Burgoyne Campaign, the Saratoga Campaign. And he wanted me to write it. Uh, of course, the book was going to have lots of his paintings, lots of artifacts, and my authorship. And he asked me to do it because, you know, just like Don is super accurate with his paintings, he knows me to be uh, an accurate military historian on the thing that I'm expert on, which is the Northern Campaign of 1777. And so I jumped at the chance. And uh, we absolutely used this book as a venue to bust a lot of myths. We did a lot of other things with the book, of course. But, you know, as you know, Don's paintings bust myths. The text does that, too. So I was able to use this book as a venue to bust a couple of myths that just pervade popular myth regarding the campaign and, and, and ancillary events to the campaign. One starts off in chapter one. The Battle of Valcor Island, October 1776. I don't think you can read anything without it telling you, written by a, an enthusiast or a historian, that the Battle of Valcor Island was some kind of big victory for the Americans. And then it set the scene for, you know, triggered everything that happened in 1777. It's just not true. The Battle of Valcor Island was a complete disaster for American arms. And honestly, it had no bearing on, on the Northern Campaign of 1777. The Americans at Ticonderoga and Mount Independence in July of 1777, when they're being surrounded, they're in the process of being surrounded by Burgoyne's forces. There's this old story where a couple of cannons, British cannons, were put on top of Mount Defiance. And those British cannons scared the Americans out of their defenses. And that's the thing that made them leave those forts. It's not at all true. The cannons were never on Mount Defiance at the time the Americans were actually uh, physically there. There's another story, uh, Jane McRae. This is a very popular one, and it's a tragic one, the tragedy of Jane McRae. She was a, a, uh, an American woman with, uh, shall we say, royalist sympathies. She was, in fact, <clears throat> um, uh, betrothed to one of the royalist American officers in Burgoyne's army. And uh, infamously, she was uh, taken into custody by some First Nations warriors with General Burgoyne's army. And in the process of being brought back to Burgoyne's camp, she was killed by one of them. Uh, this picture that we're looking at now is Don Troiani's depiction of the moment when Jane McRae is about to be killed. There are, if you just do a, an online search, go to your favorite search engine, Google, whatever, and do Jane McRae, you're going to find dozens and dozens and dozens of images depicting her demise. And believe it or not, there are more images depicting her demise than there are of the surrender at Saratoga, you know, or this, <laughs> this hugely momentous event. I'm not kidding. Uh, this is one of them. This is a ridiculous, fanciful, atrocious picture from the 19th century. I mean, it's just bonkers crazy. And believe it or not, it's not the craziest one that's out there. I, that's one of the more... Uh, 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 imaginative ones, but it's not the most crazy. But anyway, okay. books often will include pictures like that. Why? Because they're free. They're copyright free. You can put them in your book free gratis and you don't have to pay any licensing fees. And, you know, as a historian and Don, as an artist, we want to get rid of those old tiny pictures that have no place in a serious, in this case, military history. So Don's painting of Jane McRae's death shows the moment when she's dying. The uh, First Nations warriors are dressed and kitted uh, and colored appropriately in their, in their war paint. She is dressed appropriately. And what's really amazing about this is we actually have an eyewitness description of some of the clothing that she wore, which included a, a black uh, petticoat and a light chintz gown. And there you see a black uh, over petticoat. Women wouldn't wear just one petticoat. Typically, they'd wear a couple. And then there's that light chintz gown. You'll never find that in other depictions of artwork showing her death. But Don puts it in there uh, with the models and everything because, you know, he, he's, he's the artist. So he wants to make sure all the material culture is correct. The looks of the people are correct. Uh, including Jane, McCray, Jane McCray's hair color, which is another thing that there's a lot of... Uh, uh, you know, the, the people, uh, you know, having different opinions about black or brown or red or blonde. And there's all, they're all backed by some kind of 
historical evidence from the 19th century written by people who never knew her or saw her or were even alive at the time, you know. So anyway, th th these are just a couple of those things in this book that we took the opportunity to myth bust. And I loved it. Myth busting, one of my favorite things. <laughs> Well, now that you've, you know, basically destroyed the Valcor Island uh, visit of our tour. That was and, Rick's favorite battle, by the way. Favorite battle, and then damaged the uh, the Ticonderoga visit. Uh, I think we're going to be wrapping up this episode early. <laughs> we're, we're, right, we're out of here. It's, <laughs> carry on, Eric. No. Carry on by yourself. You're, no, no. Um, Hey, Ticonderoga has so much going for it. It's an amazing historic site, one of my favorites personally. It's just amazing. It's beautiful. It's fantastic. Run by some of the most brilliant living historians and historians outright that you'll ever find at a, 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 a you know a museum. Just incredible. Um, but uh, yeah, as for those cannons on top of Mount Defiance scaring the Americans away, never happened. So what, what does get the Americans thrown away? Well, practicality, honestly, as I lay out in the book, uh, Arthur Sinclair, the American commander at Ticonderoga and Mount Independence, basically there were two forts across from uh, across the lake from each other, working in concert under yep. the same unified commander. Arthur Sinclair called a council of war, and uh, they were observing a couple things, and these minutes are recorded, which is really great. They were talking about how artillery pieces were being brought up to, uh, by the British to be uh, used uh, against the French lines, which are near Fort Ticonderoga. They're right. just kind of west, north, northwest of Fort Ticonderoga. And I think a lot of historians, early historians, confused that with thinking that, because they don't say, you know, they, they say artillery pieces are being brought up. And they know the st early historians knew the story of cannons being brought up out to defiance, which did happen eventually. And they thought, well, there it is, cause and effect. But unfortunately, that's the wrong cause matching up with the wrong effect. Uh, we know for a fact that those cannons weren't brought up until after the Americans withdrew. They also, in the minutes, they do point out that they did see red coats on the top of Mount Defiance. And there were, in fact, British troops up there because uh, General Fraser and other British officers and soldiers had gotten up there to survey, you know, the, the, from the view of Mount Defiance and see if bringing artillery up there was at all practicable. And they decided it was. And they began the process of getting those cannons up there. Uh, and eventually, eventually they did. After the OK. Day. All right. Well, we, we can we can make that work. <laughs> <laughs> um, Eric, I want to ask you about uh, you. Know, one of the um, heroes of the Battle of Saratoga is that uh, 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 a great American oh, yeah. figure, yeah, there we go. Benedict Arnold? Yeah, who uh, later uh, goes over to the uh, to the dark side. Uh, <laughs> Darth Vader convinces him to join the evil empire. Here's oh, here's wow. his uh, here's his boot, uh, a statue of his boot, which is the only a statue of him uh, on the Saratoga battlefield. Uh, and of course he lost, uh, uh, I think he, I don't know if he lost his leg, but he was badly, badly wounded in the, in the leg in the battle. And um, in many of the tellings of this battle, um, uh, part of the story enshrined in this is his tempestuous relationship with his commander, Horatio Gates. Um, and I'm going to do something, and I know how much Chris is going to love this, okay? <laughs> I'm going to read something from one of my own books, okay? I don't, can I, does that call for a drink? Chris says now we should all take a drink, not only when uh, we're promoting the Ghost Army, but any time I'm promoting. That's two then, Ghost Army and. All right. All right. Okay. One moment. Awesome. Okay. All right. But let me read to you. I think this is the kind of thing that we're talking about, Eric. Um, uh, Arnold had been quarreling. This is, okay. This is, all right, all right. Arnold had been uh, quarreling with the commanding general for days, and just hours before he had been dismissed for insubordination. But once the battle began, the headstrong officer couldn't stay away. Damning his orders, he downed a slug of rum, leaped onto a borrowed horse, and raced up to the front line, saber flashing. Men rallied around him, and he led them into the teeth of British fire. So, so that's yeah, really. Why answer, Eric? But I, I, I believe you. I just want to, I just want to say before you. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, so, uh, but, but my understanding is uh, from now, from reading your book, 
uh, and uh, and some of the other stuff that you have written about this, that there's a newly discovered material that suggests that I'm going to have to do a little bit of a rewrite there. Uh, unfortunately, um, we, we all are. Uh, when this letter in question came out, and the letter triggered a project that, that I made, which is a review of the historiography and all of the primary source information related to Benedict Arnold in the Second Battle of Saratoga as relates with his relationship with Horatio Gates. And I developed a program on this, and Bob's your uncle, wouldn't you know it? It's very interesting. Every single 18th century source that talks about Arnold and Gates on the day of the Second Battle of Saratoga is perfectly in line with this newly discovered letter that you're showing right now, written by Nathaniel Batchelor. He was an adjutant of a militia battalion from New Hampshire, and he wrote to his wife a couple of days after the Second Battle of Saratoga. So you see page one there on the top, and then my, my, my script behind it. Um, and the description he gives about what happened with regards to Benedict Arnold and Horatio Gates in the Second Battle of Saratoga was amazing. I remember to this day, it's one of those moments, I was reading it on my computer and I stopped midway. I didn't read the whole letter at first, I stopped. I got up out of my chair and I just, I thought to myself, this could be one of those moments that historians crave when you have a new piece of evidence that might change something so important, something so intrinsically connected with the story that, in this case, we all know and love, Saratoga, that it really you know, changes everything. So like I said, it triggered a historiographical review and a review of the primary sources. And what's fascinating about this is that the early 19th century history was perfectly in line with Nathaniel Batchelor, as were the uh, memoirs of people writing in the 1820s, people like William Hall and uh, um, uh, um, uh, um, Richard Brooks. Mm. But there was a change, and that's in the year 1816. 1816, a certain guy named James Wilkinson writes a memoir of my own times. And he completely bastardized the story. He removed Arnold from the equation, put himself in Arnold's role. He subsumed Arnold's role completely. And then he's the guy, Wilkinson, in his crackpot memoir from 1816. He put Benedict Arnold out on his horse without a command, without troops to lead, crazy Benedict Arnold. Uh, with the stolen horse and swinging the sword around without a care in the world and bopping his own officers on the head. And in my one of my favorite later accounts, this comes from uh, 1850s, a guy claims that he was there and that he saw Benedict Arnold not only take some rum for himself, but down a bunch of rum uh, down his horse's gullet. I kid you not. So not only was it full, yeah. full of rum, but that so of horse because everybody's crazy and we know in the mid 19th century, you know, at least according to this one uh, uh, reverend who wrote about it, you know, the, the, the alcohol was evil. So uh, they had to demonize the alcohol with the consummate traitor of the United States. And uh, it, it's all nicely packaged into a moral uh, story for everybody to, to read. And, and the, the Genesis story for all of these lies was James Wilkinson, 1816. And I have the proof for it, which is fascinating. Wow. And, and James Wilkinson could be a whole other show because he is oh, yeah. undoubtedly the absolute worst person to ever wear general stars in the American army. He was evil, evil, downright evil. And he, he was a spy for Spain, it turned out, after his death. He was uh, plotting with Aaron Burr um, until he ratted out Aaron Burr. Exactly, yep. Uh, and he also, you know, sucked up to Alexander Hamilton. There's a, there's a wonderful, wonderful, he's just an amazing character. I think just understood. But don't you think this is an example of, you know, we, we were talking to uh, Joe Belkowski on this uh, show um, some weeks ago. It seems like about a year ago, but I'm sure it was only uh, six or eight weeks ago. Uh, and, you know, he was writing about, um, D-Day in the 29th Division, and he basically really only wanted to pay attention to sources that came, you know, right after the battle or, or within a year or two. He, he just felt that if you 
if you look at the sources that come 20, 30, 40, 50 years later, even if they're people who were there, yeah. that it's going to be corrupted. Yeah, that's a great point. I'm glad you mentioned this. When Don contacted me about writing the book, there were a couple of things he wanted to do, because I wrote everything in the book, all the captions, all the end notes, all the narrative text. But he said that he wanted a lot of original, you know, primary source quotes in the book, including references from pension records. And for American soldier veterans, these are often from the 1830s through the 1832 Pension Act. Some of them are earlier, some of them are later, but a lot of them are from the 1830s. I'd say most of them are. And so this uh, pension records, pension depositions given by participants in the battles of Saratoga are things that I'm very keen and very interested in. Uh, I haven't read them all. God knows there's, you know, a bajillion of them out there and they're not easily searchable. You have to know, you know, what military unit a person served in to see if they viably might have left a, uh, an account about their service at Saratoga. And as I, as I say in the book, uh, the pension references in the book are, are vetted. They're vetted by me, curated, if you will. I make sure that ones that are overtly crazy don't enter in there because the fact is, as many of these men had aged, they were misremembering things. I mean, there's a guy who claims that he saw Lafayette wounded in the battles of Saratoga, General Lafayette. You know, it's like, no, I I'm That's sorry. That's got to be tough. Yeah, right. Exactly. How'd that happen when, you know, exactly. So, you know, I wasn't there, but I know you didn't see the Marquis de Lafayette wounded. It didn't happen. But there are other uh, pension records that when you can cross reference with other primary sources right. and you see perfect cohesion, then you're like, OK, this is absolutely legit. And when you immerse yourself in this time period with the, the writings and, 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 and everything, you know, well, first person accounts, letters, journals, you really over decades, you know, you get a you get a sense of the flavor of the period. And not that you know it all. You, you will never know it all, of course. That'll never happen, uh, unfortunately, unless we invent a TARDIS and go back in time and check things out, right? But uh, there's my English reference. Oh, well, yeah, what I'm Holy cow. You're not such a bad guy after all. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, when, when you, when you um, have, have a, a sense of these things and, you know, you can, you can often see the legitimate ones, at least the probably legitimate ones, and the ones that just aren't remembered quite well. And those are the ones to stay away from. Not that they're not interesting, not that they shouldn't be studied, but not for a, what we like to think of as a, you know, purist military history, which um, uh, uh, focuses mostly on primary sources written in 1777 or shortly thereafter. So, um, so Eric, one is, you know, obviously where the battle is, as you said, uh, one of the turning points in the revolution um, obviously, I've made my feelings about the revolution pretty clear on this and other shows. Um, I was just kind of curious, um, could it have turned out differently for the British? Uh, and if it had, uh, you know, what impact would have that had larger? I don't want to get into too many what ifs, but it seems, you know, when you read about 1777, when I read, what I read is like, what were they thinking? This is just so over the top complex. Um, could it have turned out differently? Um, and, and where do you think it went off the rails? Wow, what a great question. One of the things that I myth bust in this book is the whole strategic initiative that the British planned behind the Northern Campaign of 1777. If you go on, I don't know, Wikipedia, not to pick on Wikipedia, but I'm sure it's there, or you know, pretty much any history book on this campaign, the author will tell you that the British plan was to have Burgoyne come out of Canada, St. Ledger come out of Canada, and General Howe come up from New York City, and then these three military forces would converge on Albany, and then they would you know, crush the rebellion or something like that. That's not true. That was never the plan. That's not at all what the plan was. The plan was this. Burgoyne's army was to come out of Canada, St. Ledger out of Canada. Those two military forces were to meet at Albany. And because of the way, and I, this is something that no, I've never seen an author do this, and it's so important to understand. I can't tell you how important it is. And I, I do it in this book. I, I hope I don't belabor the point, but it's so important to understand that the British command in North America was divided in two. You have General Howe, commander in chief of British military forces in the 13 colonies, Nova Scotia and the Floridas. Sir Guy Carleton is his equal in Canada and the territories dependent thereon, as they call it. 
So Burgoyne's army starts out of Canada. He starts out of Carlton's department. And once he's in upstate New York, bam, he's in Howe's department. He's under Howe's jurisdiction. Burgoyne will, during the campaign, literally write back to Carlton and say, hey, Carlton, you know what? I never really planned to garrison Fort Ticonderoga and Mount Independence. I never thought I wouldn't have those troops with my army as I proceed to Albany. I really got to bring these troops with me. Can you, can you garrison Ticonderoga from Canada? And Carlton's like, uh, no, that's never anything that was discussed, nor planned, nor uh, approved by the king. That's not going to happen. Yeah, I mean, it shows you how badly they, they considered this. You know, Sin Ledger, he comes out of Canada and he finds Fort Stanwix, i.e. Fort Schuyler, completely defended by a large military force in good, good standing with a lot of provisions on hand and ready to defend again to the last man. And the British, uh, you know, Sin Ledger's command never had a plan to deal with that, never had a plan because intelligence had informed them that the fort was dilapidated and, and unmanned. As for Howe, and he, I think, is the guy who dropped the ball more than anybody. <clears throat> General Howe was so bent on taking Philadelphia when he realized that, you know, capital city, we got to take Philadelphia, largest city in the hemisphere. That's going to really end the revolution, he thinks. So he has this grand plan to take Philadelphia by land. And then the foraging wars occur in the spring of 1777 in New Jersey. And uh, he realizes that a land approach to Philadelphia would be untenable. So he has to do it by sea, and that's what he ends up doing. But that delays his move on Philadelphia until you know, mid, mid uh, summer. And then he only writes for the Crown's approval after he's actually in the process of making this move. The Crown approves the plan of how, and they say, and they stipulate, and I quote it in the book, uh, George Germain, because you don't write the king directly, you don't do that, right? So George Germain, the intermediary between Howe and the king, George Germain writes to Howe, to Howe and says, yes, the king approves your plan to take Philadelphia by sea, but you must, General Howe, be uh, in a position to be able to uh, coordinate and communicate with Burgoyne, because you're the commander in chief, you're his boss, you gotta tell Burgoyne what to do. And you know what Howe never did? Never bothered, nor did he have a plan to assist Burgoyne if things went wrong, and things went wrong, for the British anyway. Right for the United States, wrong for the British. Yeah. Um, I want to just uh, tell everybody that we are speaking uh, with Eric Schnitzer, who's a historian, author, uh, park ranger, interpreter, and reenactor. Uh, and one of the leading experts, uh, one of the foremost experts on the Battle of Saratoga and the whole campaign, the Northern Campaign of 1777. And I want to encourage anybody who has questions about this to uh, pop them up there on the comments side, whether you're watching us on YouTube or whether you're watching us on Facebook, uh, we should be able to see your questions. And I have one here and I think I'm going to have to take this um, since it comes okay. from my wife. Uh, so we know we have at least one viewer. No, we have many. Um, uh, but she says the musical Hamilton, oh. Chris, we're losing him, introduced us to the Schuyler sisters. Wasn't the Battle of Saratoga fought a few miles from Philip Schuyler's home? And I think this is actually his summer home um, uh, north of, uh, of, uh, of Saratoga there. And did Schuyler or even Alexander Hamilton have any role in the battle? I can answer that. Marilyn, yes, Alexander Hamilton did have a role in the battle. He was attempting to bore the British army to death. All right, sorry. I think we, we 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 just we just lost Chris or we just lost our signal with Chris Anderson. And so uh, oh 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 it's back. Oh, and you're in a different place now, Chris. That is Chris and I just switched places. Do I have to now uh, harass Hamilton? Uh, go, ahead. go ahead. Eric, well we will let you talk eventually. Oh, all right, thank you. Uh, you know, the, 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 I, as I understand it, because I've never seen the play, Chris will be proud of me. Uh, I, believe, <laughs> I believe that indeed they, they refer to the, the Schuyler sisters, and I think there are three of them in the play. In there fact, are three of them, yes, three of them in the play, and at least three in reality. Yeah, I, I was going to mention there, there were five total. Five <laughs> total. No, not, not in 1777, but eventually there were, there were five sisters, uh, not just the three. They were still um, making sisters at that time. Yep. Philip Schuyler and Catherine Schuyler. Uh, Catherine was pregnant for most of the 25 years of her life uh, with, with uh, one child or the other. They ended up having 15 kids. 
um, the age wow. of adulthood. But anyway, uh, yes, that's absolutely true. The Philip Schuyler country estate or plantation, if you will, was located in Saratoga, the very place that General Burgoyne surrendered his army. So after the battles of Saratoga were fought, Burgoyne retreated north, trying to get back to the safety of Ticonderoga and then probably back to Canada eventually. But he only made it seven miles north of Saratoga battlefield to the community called Saratoga. It is, the battles of Saratoga are, in fact, not actually fought at Saratoga. It's kind of like the Battle of Bennington wasn't actually fought at Bennington. And so many other battles were, are named after places nearby, but not actually at the place where the battle was fought. So the battles of Saratoga are fought seven miles south of Saratoga. The British retreat from the battles north to Saratoga. They get to Saratoga. Uh, the British have a, a bit of an advance. You know, they left before the Americans figured out that the British had evacuated. So it's going to take the Americans a little time to pursue. But that gives the British time to destroy some things, including the Philip Schuyler country plantation. They destroy the house, all the barns, everything, with the exception of the necessary. I kid you not. Well, that's uh, important. Yeah, very important, yes. Uh, a letter to Philip Schuyler from um, uh, Richard Varick. Uh, states that, uh, you know, telling uh, Schuyler about how everything's destroyed with the exception of your necessary. And one of the upper sawmills, which was located about a mile away. Uh, I hope you left some paper in the necessary. But... <laughs> well, if Burgoyne was nice, yeah, I'm sure he would. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, Probably, uh, 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 copies of the Declaration of Independence, right, Chris? Oh, uh, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Um, one of the things that I, I'd be curious to get your thoughts on, Eric, so when I was living in Boston, obviously the, the Boston campaign in 1775 was sort of a focus for me, um, particularly the Battle of Bunker Hill. Uh, and one of the things that a study of that campaign tells you is that this myth that the British Army was the greatest army that had ever been fielded and these brave colonials are fighting the, the most terrific military in the world is all bunk. Uh, the British Army in Boston was a nightmare. It was a train wreck waiting to happen. What was the state of the British Army that marched into New York? You know, if, if I could get a question, I think that would be it. I love that question. I think... Okay, now, I, I got to stop you now, because you like <laughs> two of Chris's questions. I don't like any of my questions. I didn't prep this. This is a big issue for me. But go ahead, please. Really I, think, like I think I might be... It, it makes the British look bad here once again, uh, like in 75 with the Boston Garrison. I think every book about the Northern Campaign of 1777 has the author telling you that Burgoyne's army was the best the army could field. The British army, one book said it was the flower of the British army, the best trained, the best veteran troops, European warfare trained, or, or you know, veterans and the like. And holy cow, that's just not the truth. What a lot of historians do is they look at the regiments that were with Burgoyne's army and they'll look at those regimental histories and they'll say, oh, look, Burgoyne had the 20th Regiment afoot with him. And oh, my gosh, the 20th was also at Minden, you know, in the Seven Years' War. And they did great there. So they're going to do great with Burgoyne's army. Totally different personnel. I mean, the, you know, the time lapse, you have very few people from the Seven Years' War left in the ranks and certainly the officer corps. So. In this book, what I did was I actually, when I introduce the respective armies for both sides, I, I, I talk about quality, I address quality, I address training, and I address uh, the quality of the officers and men. And I point out that for most of Burgoyne's red-coated soldiers, and frankly, his uh, blue-coated and green-coated uh, German uh, soldiers, the Hessians and the Braunschweigers uh, alike, most of them had never been in battle before. Most of them have never been on a military campaign before. So, you know, for, for, you know, aside from what they may have done in Canada in 76, but most of them hadn't fought in 76. And now they're on this expedition, officers and men included, for the first time in their lives, uh, uh, going on a military expedition for the first time in their lives, for most of them, they're going to be engaged in battle. General Burgoyne had never commanded an army before. His brigadier generals had never commanded brigades before in battle. Most of his regimental commanders had never commanded battalions in battle before. This matters. I quote from the general reviews, i.e. the inspection returns of the British Army, uh, the ones that we have most recently prior to 1777. So these were filed 
in, in uh, 75, 1775. And the reviewing generals for some of the regiments are saying, yeah, this regiment's fit for service. They can go be deployed wherever needs be. But for some of the other regiments, the, the uh, uh, descriptions weren't that friendly. And yeah. I quote from those in the book. Yeah. yeah. It, so it wasn't the best army that the British had to field at all, at all. Mm -hmm. Right. And I, I think you simultaneously mentioned that many of the, we don't have to go into this, but that the opposite is true of the American army there, that many of those folks had taken part in battles, whether it's uh, battles in New England, battles in New York, that there were many more sort of trained troops there. Of course, Daniel Morgan, who's there, who was part of the Battle of Quebec and captured by the British, and they shouldn't have let him go. That was a mistake. But, uh, you know, I want to come back to Benedict Arnold because, you know, we, we got so excited about talking about primary history uh, sources that uh, Robert Freetag pointed out. We, we never did explain what the bachelor letter yes. uh, changes about our understanding of the relationship between Benedict Arnold and Horatio Gates. And I would add to that the question that I think Robert is also asking is, did you know, does that mean he's not a hero of Freeman's farm? Oh, not at all. Just the opposite. Just the opposite. I would say he's even more heroic. This is very interesting. So what we have now with the Nathaniel Bachelor letter, as well as other primary sources written at the time, as well as memoirs by other officers uh, written at the time or, or, or shortly thereafter, we have a situation where Benedict Arnold and Horatio Gates absolutely came um, uh, to, shall we say, not really like each other after the Battle of Freeman's Farm. I put a quote in the book that I, I don't think I've ever seen before quoted by any historian in which in the Battle of Freeman's Farm, the first battle of Saratoga, Benedict Arnold wants more reinforcements because the battle's going pretty well for the uh, American arms. So he rides back to headquarters and he says, hey, Gates, can I have reinforcements? Can you send them to me uh, to, to prop up the, the, our forces in the battle? And Gates refuses, Arnold presses, and Gates responds by saying, I'm the commander-in-chief of this army, and he draws his sword on Arnold to tell him that. That's actually from a letter written by a guy right at the time who was there, not written 50 years later in some you know, pension record or something like that. And we, and should, then, we should just mention, we should just mention that, uh, and some people know this and some won't, Saratoga's two battles, yes. Freeman's Farm is in September, 1777, Bemis Heights, the second battle, is in October 1777. So you're talking there about Freeman's Farm. Absolutely. First Battle of Saratoga, that's right. After that battle, these two guys definitely had a fallout. Uh, for many reasons, it, it, I describe it in the book, but they had a falling out. They were not on speaking terms. Uh, there are letters between them. I quote from those letters. Those letters still exist, and those letters sound like elementary school children having a tiff, uh, <laughs> writing back and forth in this case. It's wonderful because we have what they're, because they're not speaking, you know, so we have it in written form. And it's incredible the pettiness that these two guys exhibit. It's absolutely petty. And I do refer to it in the book. But then in kind of the early part of October, after October 1st, which is the last correspondence these two guys had, after October 1st, suddenly there's silence. Now, we don't absolutely know why, and I point it out in the book, sometimes we just don't know, at least at this point, we don't know. Maybe five years from now we'll find out with, with authority uh, why it was that these two generals came to terms, but they did come to terms. Now, the traditional telling of the story tells us they never came to terms. They hated each other. Second battle, uh, Horatio Gates orders the attack on his own. Arnold is under arrest. He's relieved of command. He goes rogue. Um, Rick, if I may, you, you read from that uh, passage. And I've written things like that because, you know, that's exactly the kind of thing we've all been led to believe by every single uh, secondary source on, on the matter. Uh, so, uh, and by James Wilkinson, who was there, by the way, he was. Right, so he's he technically, he's a, he's a primary, I'm not defending myself no. because wrong is wrong, but oh, oh. technically he is a primary source. You'd say, well, I can, I can trust this. That's yeah. somebody who was there. He was the Army's Deputy Adjutant General at the age of 20. Lieutenant Colonel James Wilkinson, he was there. And his memoir, you know, it, it reads true, kind of. And if anybody knows what was going on, it would be him, right? Here's the clincher, though, and I love this. There's a letter written by Henry Dearborn to James Wilkinson in 1815. It's James Wilkinson 
he asked, James, uh, let me go back. James Wilkinson asked Henry Dearborn to write to him, Wilkinson, about his military experience in the Northern Campaign of 1777 because Wilkinson is writing a book, right? Wilkinson wants this firsthand account from Dearborn because he, Wilkinson's writing this book, this memoirs, and he wants to put a bunch of facts and cool anecdotes in it, and he wants Dearborn to write him so he can add Dearborn to the mix. And Dearborn responds, and Dearborn writes this in 1815, this wonderful letter to James Wilkinson for information to include in the memoir. It's literally purpose-built for that. It's Henry Dearborn that says that Benedict Arnold ordered out Morgan's corps, that Benedict Arnold commanded Morgan to ascend a particular hill to make the attack, that Benedict Arnold had the authority by Gates to make the attack occur. James Wilkinson completely bastardized Dearborn's account. Dearborn, by the way, was actually with Morgan. He was there on the field of battle. Wilkinson was too, time and, you know, back and forth between headquarters and the field. But James Wilkinson bastardized that and completely subsumed Arnold's role for himself. He literally replaced Arnold with himself. The consummate liar here, James Wilkinson, did this. Yeah. And he did it because you can do it because it's the year 1816. And who's going to defend Benedict Arnold in the United States? Nobody. You know, Arnold's dead. Well, yeah, except Chris. <laughs> but Benedict Arnold's dead. He's an evil traitor. He's the devil. So you can you can do that kind of thing. But what Bachelor and all these other people tell us with authenticity is that by the time of the Second Battle of Saratoga, and I'll make a long story quick. I lay out more in more detail in the book. But to make a long story quick, Benedict Arnold and Horatio Gates were on speaking terms. Benedict Arnold had never been relieved of command. Never happened. The battle is beginning because Burgoyne's probing force triggered a bunch of American sentinels to have a, some, you know, firefight. Benedict Arnold got permission from Gates and Arnold wanted it. Arnold says, hey, Gates, can I go check things out? I promise not to commit you. And that's a quote uh, from one of the primary sources. And Gates consents. He says, okay, go out, check the scene, see what's going on. So Horatio Gates himself then starts to deploy a couple of regiments to assist the Sentinels and the Piquette that were having a firefight and losing, by the way, with the British forces out at the Barber Wheat Fields, uh, which is where the Second Battle of Saratoga began. Benedict Arnold rides back to camp after observing all this, saying, hey, we're falling back, we're losing. Can you please let me command a massive attack? He says, and I quote in the Nathaniel Bachelor letter, give me some men and we'll have fun with them before sunset. Quote, unquote, from Nathaniel Bachelor. And he was right there when it happened for reasons I could explain if we had the time. It, but it happens that he was absolutely legitimately right there at Arnold's headquarters when this thing happened because Gates was at Arnold's headquarters at the time. And Gates said, yes. Gates allowed Arnold uh, uh, to, to make that attack occur. Now, I love this because it makes Arnold a better hero because he had the insight to make the attack occur, the attack which proved decisive. In every previous telling of this battle, Benedict Arnold is simply a rogue general that goes out there and joins the fight because he can't stay away, and he just is out there, drunkard, drunken horse, all that nonsense, and then he, he gets wounded. That's the, that's the tale we hear. Is that heroic? It's personally brave, maybe, maybe, because he's putting himself in the line of fire, but it's not you know, leadership. It's not being a general of a professional military army. No. If he had no command, what's he doing out there? Well, he did have a command. And he went through the proper chain of command and he did it right. And Horatio Gates, and this is why I like it too, Horatio Gates is seen to be heroic as well. Because Horatio Gates, despite the infighting that these two guys had had, Horatio Gates recognizes that Benedict Arnold has the right, uh, has the right idea here. That this tactic needs to go forth. So Horatio Gates is better because he's showing great leadership. And Benedict Arnold is better because, because he's showing great strategic and tactical prowess. And, and here's Chris's uh, uh, contribution, photographic contribution on Benedict Arnold <laughs> that he sent us. When he was far from your house, right? Yep, uh, Marylebone, and uh, it's a very nice house. Uh, interesting story about that is um, uh, the person that owned the house, this is back in uh, 1984, amateur historian, and he wanted to have one of those famous blue plaques that you see all over London. Uh, on in front of his house. Um, and uh, the English Heritage said, um, sorry, but no, you can't have a blue plaque. Uh, so at his own expense, he commissioned this 
um, and Mar Marley Bone, and that's out in front of the house now. So it's the unofficial official blue plaque for Benedict Arnold. And you like that it says American Patriot. He was. There's many ways to interpret that. Yes. <laughs> that's so that's, right. that's pretty cool. That is so, cool. I, I, I had a couple questions, and I hope we have time for them all. But if not, you can stop me. Um, but one, um, you've used, uh, you know, Don Triani is the co-author. Uh, Don's pictures are famous for their meticulous attention to detail. Um, and I know Don uses uh, artifacts to actually tell the story, do the paintings. What, what makes an artifact from the battle a valuable resource for you as an, as an author? Is it, is it just a thing or does it actually help illuminate something about the story? That's, oh, yeah. a, that's a great question, Chris. Yeah. I'll just say it because I know Eric was about to. So I'll just throw <laughs> it in there. It's a great question. Absolutely. Thank you. Admittedly, there are some artifacts which are just cool things. And they don't, I think, change history. They don't tell us a lot of, you know, all important aspects regarding strategy or, or national pride or whatever. Uh, some do, some don't. But there are sometimes artifacts that tell us so much that if we didn't have the artifacts and we didn't have an understanding of that material culture, we wouldn't really get the truth behind the story. And one of those artifacts, and there are many in the book, but one of those artifacts is a simple cartridge pouch. The cartridge pouch, which we're looking at right now, is an artifact owned by Don himself. He owns this piece. And it was carried by a private soldier in the 62nd Regiment of Foot, that soldier would have fought in the first battle of Saratoga, maybe the second battle of Saratoga. And he certainly had that with him at Saratoga when the British army surrendered. Now the cartridge pouch, you see it's kind of opened, the leather flap is opened and the, the wooden block is popping out. It's in that wooden block that you would keep cartridges, which are your ammunition. They're wrapped in paper and they have the bullet uh, the musket ball, they have uh, black powder, again, wrapped up in paper, tied off with twine. Um, this particular cartridge pouch is really uh, 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 modern for the period because it fit 18 rounds on one side and 18 rounds on the other. So you could literally flip it back and forth for a total of 36 rounds. But this is a cartridge pouch, and this is very important. When it comes to the question of why is it that General Burgoyne's army, which surrendered at Saratoga, an army which was supposed to, according to the Convention of Saratoga, agree to be between Gates and Burgoyne, go back home to Great Britain or Ireland so that, you know, they're out of the mix of the American war. Why is it that they are kept as prisoners of war in America for, for years to come in Massachusetts and in Pennsylvania and in Virginia? They're prisoners of war. What happened to that convention? Why did the American Congress break the convention? It's because principally, there are a couple reasons for it, but principally it's because of that cartridge pouch. According to British nomenclature, that cartridge pouch is called an accoutrement. The British army has, you know, very strict nomenclature with regard to various points of material culture. That thing is classified as an accoutrement. It's private property. It was purchased by the Colonel of the regiment. It's not something supplied by the government. According to the Convention of Saratoga agreed to between Burgoyne and Gates, it said that the British were supposed to surrender their arms, meaning things like muskets and bayonets and, you know, uh, swords, things like that, as long as they're soldier swords. And indeed, these things were surrendered. When Congress got a copy of the, the items surrendered at Saratoga, they said, uh, where are the cartridge boxes? The Americans called them cartridge boxes, typically. And the British response, Burgoyne's particular, his response was, uh, well, no, no, the convention said we were supposed to surrender our arms, which we did. What you're calling cartridge boxes, American Congress, we call them cartridge pouches. And Burgoyne wasn't lying about this. He's absolutely legit. We call them cartridge pouches. We classify them as accoutre accoutrements. They're private property. And they're not subject to being surrendered. Only things owned by government, like muskets and cannons, those get surrendered. Arms, not arms and accoutrements, just arms. Congress got Burgoyne's response, and Burgoyne was correct, but again, I got to reiterate that Burgoyne was right. And Congress got the response and said, eh, we don't see that perspective. We think arms are everything related to accoutrements or whatever you're calling them. Arms uh, are, include, you know, the pouches and the muskets. And because you didn't surrender them, Burgoyne, even though you have your own particular nomenclature, oh, well, uh, we're going to force your army to stay as prisoners in this country. 
and they passed a resolution in December of 1776 saying that very fact, and it's in the book. Good move. Yeah. And this little detail, which seems insignificant, literally changes the course of lives of thousands and thousands of British and German soldiers. And I can mm -hmm. tell you from personal experience, many of those guys, in fact, most of those guys that are prisoners of war, in effect, they become prisoners of war in Pennsylvania, in Virginia, and in Massachusetts uh, in 77, 78, they desert. And a lot of them meld into American society. They get families, they have kids, they have descendants, and thousands, hundreds of thousands of people in this nation today, the United States, are descended from these soldiers, and these they're descended, they, they exist because of this little idiosyncratic difference in nomenclature between a cartridge pouch and a cartridge box. It's crazy, but true. Yeah. So artifacts can matter. See? And, and, and Rick, can I ask one more question? Are you about to... to... Yes. Well, yeah. Go, Chris. I would never deprive you of that opportunity. Well, this is kind of one of my favorite wrap-up questions. But um, since you've been at the battlefield for so long, and you probably have walked that ground more than anybody alive, even more so than the people that were there on the day of the battle, huh. what can being on the ground and studying the ground tell you and help you understand an event better? Obviously, you know we work for Ambrose or. Rick and I did at one point. So uh, traveling to battlefields and seeing historic sites are kind of important to us. And we'd like to know what you think the value of these places are. Yes. Oh, wow. If I may. Great, I great question, Chris. Thank you, Rick. Thank I you. did have that one on my list too. Just, just to say, I could, sh I could show you. It's, it's there. I gave you the option. Okay. You no, you're, you're awesome, baby. It is a great question, and if I may, I'd like to demonstrate by example of how uh, significant that can be. Certainly, field forest configurations, you know, trees and clearings, uh, yeah, can't necessarily get a good sense of that because, you know, the grounds have been denuded of trees and the you know, trees have grown up since, but they're nothing like the trees of 1777. But for the most part, the hills are, the ravines are. And so in, in one particular case, and I talk about it in the book because it's so important, there was a particular fortification called Bremen's Fortified Camp. It was a German position in, within the British camp. And there was, between the battles of Saratoga, and there were two and a half weeks separating the two battles, there was a German officer who was stationed there writing to his father. The letter still exists in, in the original Handschrift, you know, German. And uh, he writes saying that, uh, he's describing the fort, and then he goes, uh, the, the, uh, the fort is being built. Colonel Bryman, the commander of that particular fort, wants that fortification to be built on the hill to the front. But the English engineer disagrees. That's what he says. Kind of vague, but it's like, ah, oh, tell us more about why, you know? But he says the English engineer disagrees. So Colonel Bryman wants this fort built uh, on the hill to the front. So when you study the Second Battle of Saratoga, the American forces, led up by Benedict Arnold, frankly, absolutely dominate and overrun the Bryman fortified camp. It's one of the uh, principal paintings Don has made, and that's in the book. It's, it's just this wonderful painting about the Germans retreating. The Americans are just absolutely flooding over uh, the hill to the front of the fort, the hill that was undefended, the hill that actually was about 50 yards in front of the fort, but was higher in elevation than the highest point within the, hill, the, the fort itself. This hill was used as cover for American forces. What they did was they go around the clearing in front of the fort. They go through the clearing at a distance so the Germans inside the fort couldn't touch the Americans doing it. And then they took up position behind that hill, again, about 50 yards from the fort walls itself. And so when the time came to initiate the mass attack, the Americans simply flooded over the hill. Now, you have that, you have maps showing the fortification positions with the hills. You have this narrative by this German officer, Heinrich Ulick, talking about it to his father before the second battle. But to be on the ground and to see the fortification site, which was found archaeologically, absolutely, and then to see that still existing hill in front of its position, you realize, wow, these guys totally made a mistake, these Germans. <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry, the English engineer, no offense, Chris. He made the mistake about the fourth position. It happens um, again. <laughs> I remember him. You can't get that kind of ground truth without actually walking the grounds. 
Wow. Well, Eric Schnitzer, we could go on for a second hour, but we're going to have to save it for some other time. So thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks, and thank we want to give a shout out to you and uh, to uh, painter Don Troiani uh, and mention your book, uh, Don Troiani's Campaign to Saratoga, 1777. Don's not old enough to have been on the actual campaign, but uh, his paintings filled the book, which is excellent. I have been reading it. I have it sitting here right in front of me just to say yes. And I, I purchased that, darn it. So, um, you know, that's at least one sale that you got there. And Eric, we, we really appreciate your being with us. Thank you so much. And uh, hopefully you can come back someday. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank you so much. Take care. So that was, that was pretty awesome. I think so. Yeah, that was, I, I want, I learned stuff there. So that's pretty good. Uh, we have a, a few things, a few things to do here, Chris. And one is um, we have, uh, we have a still, we are actually over an hour. So, so be brief, Chris, but you have a history happened here from that little town you live in, uh, in, uh, um, in, uh, in that island next to Ireland. Yes. Yes. That one. Yes. Tell us about that. What, 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 well, I don't know which picture you're going to put well, up. Well, I got, I got your pictures, so you start oh, well, talking about what uh, A picture of good King George. Okay, let's talk about King George. Our last king. Uh, that picture was taken just down from Trafalgar Square. Um, and what I find very interesting about uh, that statue, it was erected in 1836. Uh, and uh, the king is riding on his ho favorite horse, Adonis. But what is so interesting to me about that statue is it is the first statue of a British uh, member of the British royal family that is raised entirely due to public uh, subscription. Wow. So it was raised because he is popular with the people. And it's there today, and I took a picture of that. So that's the first picture. Okay, and we'll we'll do we'll do well, we'll do one more here. Well, we can do it. The second one, uh, there's that is uh, Thomas Gage. The blue plaque for Thomas Gage was the commander of British forces in North America. And as a uh, Bostonian by birth, uh, he was the commander of British forces in Boston when that late unpleasantness began. Yes, and, and that's, that's his house. house. And he has some very nice real estate that he retired to. Awesome. So I thought I would share those too. So I think it's it is it is with some trepidation I say that it is it is my turn to do okay. the um, history joke of the week. Okay, what is your joke? Okay, so Chris, how come there are no knock knock jokes about Independence Day? Why are there no knock knock jokes about Independence Day, right? Because Chris, freedom doesn't knock. Freedom rings. Oh. Okay. I think, I think that qualifies as pretty bad. That does qualify. Well, in my book, yeah. <laughs> Didn't you agree? Did you uh, make that up little... Pardon? Did you make that up yourself? I did not. Okay. I, I stole it from some elementary school website. <laughs> <laughs> hey, in honor of the fourth, don't we have a public service announcement that you were talking about? We as you're jumping on, I, we do oh. want to mention that next week, next week we're going, thank God, we're going back to World War II when we're on the same side. And uh, we're going to interview, uh, uh, bring with us Lynn Olson, a terrific author of many books, but the one most recent is Madame Fourcade's Secret War, about a, a female leader of the French resistance in uh, World War II. So we're excited about that. And we also want to mention that uh, we do have Chris a brand new history happy hour webpage. Yes, we do. And, uh, and I'm posting that up here in the comments section. So, so copy that if you, if you're interested, you know, bookmark it. And that is your ticket to figuring out who the upcoming guests are. You can watch all the past shows. You can check out the reading list and there's oh, exciting right. books, which are so good. Exciting personal details about Chris's life are also there, um, <laughs> which you may not be aware of. Somebody said, suggested, Chris, that maybe you were a model for a Don Troiani. I painting. was. When I so was, we don't have to investigate this and bring that photo better. image back later on. Okay. But, but since it is Independence Day, we do have a final uh, a birthday greeting to America 
that I thought, Chris, you would especially appreciate it because it comes from a group that we were talking about today, yes, the British Army. Here it is. America, on your Independence Day, we would like to clarify some confusion that has arisen on how to make the perfect British cup of tea. Firstly, you will require the correct equipment. Tea bag, mug, milk, a spoon, sugar, and a kettle, not a microwave. British tanks come with this as standard. First of all, put your tea in the mug, not in the harbour. Next, add boiling hot water. Hold it there and leave it to brew. Next, remove the tea bag and add a dash of milk. Steady. Add sugar to taste. Give it a good stir. So there you have it. The perfect British cup of tea. Happy Independence Day and God save the Queen. There are actually fireworks going off in the background. How <laughs> that is the most awesome tea kettle I've ever seen in my life. Really? I, I definitely want one here. Can you can you make that happen? I'll see what I can do. I'll All right. Well, you. thank you very much, everybody, for joining us, Chris. Another great hour together. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, you know what this time means? It's time to end this puppy. That's right. We'll see you guys next week.